morning. Um, great to see everybody out bright and early through the snow. My name is Bruce Maxwell, and I am the co-director of the Montana Institute on Ecosystems. And I'm very happy to say that, uh, um, that and excited to say that, that uh, Ricardo Salvador has agreed to, to join us here. Really, uh, I've known Salvador for, for quite some time and, and read his works and, and watched his, uh, his presentations and, and immediately thought, this, this person really uh, is an Arrowite. <laughs> he belongs here. And I think he has so much to, to give us. So I'm really happy that we could bring him. Uh, Ricardo, Dr. Ricardo Salvador is Director of Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Program. This is really a significant program that has had really amazing impacts on, on so much of, of what gets legislated in our federal system. Uh, worked on the Farm Bill and introduced different aspects that I think have really been um, positive for agriculture. He works with people, scientists, economists, and politicians to transition our current food system into one that grows healthy food while employing sustainable and socially equitable practices. Previously at the uh, Kellogg Foundation, uh, he partnered with colleagues to create programs addressing ties between food, health, environment, economic development, sovereignty, and social justice. So you can kind of see that the kind of things that he's been involved with. Before that, he was a professor like me at Iowa State University, and he worked with students to establish a student-operated farm and faculty colleagues to develop the, the nation's first graduate-level sustainable agriculture program and oversaw some of the original academic research on community-supported agriculture. This was in a time when it wasn't easy to do that in a land-grant university. So um, I really have to uh, uh, applaud him for, for sticking that out and making those kind of things happen. And then to move on to, to yet bigger scale kinds of activities is really impressive. He's also worked as an extension agent with, with Texas A&M. And in 2014, he was awarded the James Baird Foundation Leadership Award for his work and advocacy in support of healthy and equitable food systems. He is, re he is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food. So join me in uh, welcoming Ricardo and really looking forward to his talk. Thank you very much, Bruce. I thought that uh, there would be nobody here this morning. I thought it was a Saturday morning and it's 8 o'clock uh, and uh, then it snowed this morning. But you're all Montanans, and it's uh, very impressive to see the crowd here. I'm uh, inexpressibly uh, happy and privileged to be here for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that I've been a longtime fan of Aero, and uh, this has to do with the fact that, as you just uh, heard Bruce Reed, I spent some time at the Kellogg Foundation, where one of our stellar projects now over 20 years ago, was to support uh, the work of Aero during the time when Nancy Matheson was leading, and I have been pleased to see her in the group here this morning. Hello, Nancy. And another reason why I'm um, really fulfilled uh, being here is that I've also been a fan of Bruce's work, uh, who just very kindly introduced me. Uh, he mentioned that there was a time that it wasn't very easy to do the kind of work that he does now at the land-grant universities. And um, I really admired his leadership during that era. Uh, I knew a little bit both about him and about Aero. It wasn't until I read Liz Carlyle's book, uh, The Lentil Underground, that I saw more of the background story of Aero and more of the background of this uh, scientist who was so strange that he believed that it was important at a land-grant university to work directly with farmers and to help them solve their problems. So it was very inspirational to be here with this group uh, and, and to be here with Bruce as a host. So um, what I'd like to do is talk to you about a topic that I hope we all agree is timely. And uh, if you fall asleep after the next minute, I'll just tell you right away what the punchline is. And that is uh, surely no news 
that the agricultural and food system that we've developed over the last 160 years is a marvel of productivity. It's a marvel of logistics. It's a marvel in many ways that I will review just very quickly, but it is not working for the majority of us, which means that in the American spirit, and I, I mean this literally, in, in the character of the thing that most identifies Americans, when something doesn't work, it needs rethinking. And so that's the conversation that you folks are uh, in at Arrow, and which I would like to contribute. So I'd like to begin by warning you that this is going to contain very little agriculture per se. We're mostly going to be talking about history and economics. I'll mostly be talking about history and economics because I think if we're really honestly thinking about rewiring the system, we have to have a really keen understanding of the decisions that we made in the past so that the future doesn't look like the past, meaning that the criteria and the values that we applied in the past need to be different if we are going to have a different outcome. And so we're living in the present with the result of decisions that our forebears made in the past. And the good news about that is that we have the capacity now to make decisions about the way that the system ought to function in the future. So what I'd like to do with that warning about what this is really all about is to just briefly go through a mythology about the agricultural system. It's a mythology in the sense that there are aspects of it that we can point to as touch points to verify that it sort of conforms with the story as we all understand it, but it isn't the complete story, so it's a mythology. And it's the heroic mythology of, of agriculture. Now, in this mythology, what we have is the story of settlers opening up a frontier. And in opening up this frontier, taking land that wasn't productive at all and turning it into some of the most productive land that is on the planet. And a key figure in this history is uh, Mr. Abraham Lincoln, who spent many years as a young person at the pointy end of a plow. And in his generation, I'm sure everybody in his situation was thinking intensively about the question that there had to be a better way to do the brutal menial work that they were engaged in at a time when everybody was involved in producing food and in a gendered way, figuring out not only how to produce it, but how to preserve it so that food was available throughout the entire year. And so there was obviously and understandably a great priority on, uh, placed on figuring out what would be better than that. As I mentioned, that's to me, uh, someone born outside of the United States, something that I see as the key characteristic of American culture, which is if it doesn't work, let's figure out a better way. So Mr. Lincoln got into a position where he could actually do something about the situation that I've described. And so let me tell you about three specific things that he did. So one of them was that he established the Department of Agriculture almost immediately upon getting into office. The other was that in the same year, he established institutions like this one by passing the Morrill Act. There's a fascinating history behind the Morrill Act that if I have time as I go along, I will tell you about, but I'll summarize here by saying, it was a, a very politically intricate act to pass, and if it hadn't been during the Civil War when the South seceded, where they were dramatically opposed to the Morrill Act for reasons that I'll explain in just a little bit, this act would not have passed. It's very likely we wouldn't be sitting here, or at least not on this campus, and a lot of history would have changed. Another thing that Mr. Lincoln did was that he established the National Academy of Sciences under a premise that under the current administration seems almost laughable, which is that in order to make the best legislative decisions, Congress needed a scientific evidence base in order to at least have the information about what would be uh, the best decision for them. So these were things that Mr. Lincoln set in motion in that year, 1862, and as I've said, we live with the consequences. Now, he was very fortunate that when he established all of those, it was almost coincident with the beginning of the fossil fuel era. You see here the Drake well in Pennsylvania that provided the energy to drive the industrialization of the country. He also signed the Transcontinental Railroad Act, which almost eliminated distances. It was the era where we, beginning to, we were beginning to mechanize to eliminate menial labor. Refrigerated railroad cars made it possible to transport perishables and meat. Uh, improvements in genetics made crops unimaginably more productive than they had been by a factor of about five. Uh, during the Second World War, a global chain of logistics to keep a standing army in the field developed technology not only to preserve food, but also that we turned to peacetime uses, such as our fertilizers. You're all familiar with that story. And in addition to that, uh, technologies that we used uh, for chemical warfare turned into our pesticides. 
And so the result of all of that, when applied in peacetime to productivity, is this heroic story of unimaginable productivity compared to what forebears in the 1860s might have even dreamed of in their, in their wildest imagination. But here's what I mean when I say that this is a mythology and that it doesn't tell the whole story. That you almost hear chest beating when this story is repeated at land grant universities and, and sometimes in political speeches. It's undeniable that there were all kinds of gains in the stories I've um, rehearsed it up until now. However, it is not the full story. An important part of the story is that, as I've said, this story doesn't work for, uh, or this system doesn't work for everyone. As a matter of fact, it doesn't work for the majority of people. That's the key thing, particularly in a country where I'll underscore the majority of us believe that we live in a democracy where majority rule has at least some sort of influence. So here's another way in which kind of in a public relations fashion, you see the food system summarized in terms of its benefits. But I wanna illustrate a couple of features about this story in a way that, uh, again, there'll be touch points in here that you're all familiar with. Uh, I got this from um, a friend who at the time was the vice president at, at General Mills. So it's essentially the structure of the food system. And what, what we'll do is just walk through it and reveal the entire structure. So you know it's founded on production, on the primary and secondary processing sectors, which then uh, generate raw materials for manufacture, and then there's a distribution system, and we see the food system at the retail and food service end. And so where we are as eaters, we really only see the food system when we go to a supermarket or a convenience store or the co-op here in Bozeman or when we sit at a restaurant or we have institutional food such as we had this morning where somebody else takes care of all the details, how it's prepared. There's stuff out there which is not in season right now when you look at the fruit plates. It's stuff that can come from any part in the world. We don't really concern, about, uh, concern ourselves about that. And when we're done, we don't worry about who's going to clean up after us. The food system is providing all of that for us. And it's this sense in which it is a very successful, complex logistical system. So we only know the part of the system that we touch. The same exact thing is true for those retailers in food service. They need a hundred weight of this or that to such specification by such time. And they only know the brokers that get that to them. And those brokers only know the distributors that get that to them. And you can see where this goes. Those distributors only know the folks that manufacture the stuff. And so these would be the Unilevers, the General Mills, the crafts of the world. So that's who they do business. And those product manufacturers deal with the Cargills and the ADMs of the world in terms of primary and secondary processing of what they consider to be the raw product. Now, uh, how many of you in the room are farmers? Okay, it looks like approaching 50%. Um, you see yourselves here? Do you see the word farmer on here? And, and remember that this comes from a vice president at General Mills. It's an internal chart that they use as this company. So here's where you are. You're in that corner down there. You're an input. You generate agricultural com uh, commodities. That's who you are. And if there is a disaster here such that you can't be relied on to provide that, on a screen, you essentially are a blip that disappears, and the blip that appears is the Pampas, or uh, maybe the southern portion of Brazil, or maybe a region in Australia, or maybe a region across central Russia. They have seven different basins all over the world where farmers are competing against each other in order to be able to sell to them they play them off against each other masterfully to gain the cheapest inputs possible into the system that is summarized here. So it's clearly working for someone, but not for people at the bottom and definitely not people in that corner, as I've described, who are basically just generating inputs. So when we look at the mythology of the way that the system is looking, it's very important to recognize that complete picture rather than just that heroic uh, mythology that I've described. Now, this has consequences, of course, and that has to do with how much we value those folks that are portrayed just basically as the input providers, replaceable folks from all over parts of the world. Um, you very rarely have the opportunity to check uh, prognostications that seers, scientists, or other forecasters make for decades into the future. And we have such an opportunity right now, 
And I'm going to do that with this paper that was published in 1992 by an economist who was then at the University of Maine by the name of Stu Smith. And what he predicted was that by now, he was predicting in 1992 that at a time that seemed impossibly remote at the time, in 2020, farming would disappear. And th that may seem like a, even a silly concept. How can that be? Even if you devalue farmers, somebody's got to be generating the raw stuff for the system that I just described. So what does that concept mean? So where he got that concept was the result of an assignment that he got uh, he, when he was seconded from the University of Maine to work with the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. The task them was figuring out where the food dollar was going. Uh, these days, there's a very modern app on the USDA website that you can go to that really breaks it down, and that is the result of the work that Sue Smith began to do back in the 90s. And what he did was to calculate where dollars were going in three sectors that he thought were the three main sectors in the agricultural system. So the folks that sell inputs to farmers, the folks that use those inputs to produce, and then the folks that buy from farmers. So he referred to those as the input farming and marketing sectors, respectively. And what he did was to look at the available data for the century prior to the time when he did the study. So essentially, this was the 20th century, the prior century. And what he did was to transform all of that to percentages, because the size of the pie was changing throughout the entire century. You know, the value of agriculture was changing throughout that entire century. So to make fair comparisons decade on decade, he converted that to proportions. And this is the picture that he saw. Now, at the bottom here, you will see a, a, the accurate uh, statistical summary. But take a look at the trends here. You can see why he predicted that if this was just going to be extrapolated linearly into the future, clearly the value of agriculture itself was disappearing and it was being absorbed. That value was not disappearing. The value was being absorbed by both the input sector and the marketing sector. A farming friend of mine uh, in Northeast Iowa told me that uh, from his standpoint, it used to be that he leveraged somebody else's money, in other words, the bank, in order to make a profit, pay them off at the end of the year if things went well. But that in the modern agricultural system, now what farmers are leveraging is somebody else's intelligence. You just buy a package and, and businesses will tell you, if you're smart, you will buy this package. That's what will, will, will make you successful. It's somebody else's intelligence. Now, let me show you what I promised, just so that you can judge for yourself whether you uh, buy the extrapolation that he made, because it has consequences. So here's what the actual statistical data look like. You can see that it goes up and down, but you can see the regression line that he drew through there, and you can see why by 2020 he expected that this would be resolving. So there's the red line of actual data, and then here is what he foresaw as the extrapolation. Now, was he wrong? As, as I mentioned, uh, we now have a chance to check. We're in 2020 nearly, and so now we can check to see what has actually happened with these trends. And if, if it beggared the imagination to figure out what would it look like for a world where we have all the food that we want, but yet no farmers exist, how does that work? Well, it's a world where we say, you know, I'm not even sure why we need farmers because can't we just have automated equipment out there applying the best inputs at precisely calculated doses according to what maps tell us will give us the best productivity down to the square inch? Really, the intelligence now is in computers that will drive all that sort of thing. Why do we even need farmers at all? And where that began to be foreshadowed was in contract agriculture and the livestock system, where essentially what happened, as uh, many of you probably know better than I do, is that Farmers would contract with a company to be assured that they had a market to sell what they were producing, but the price to pay for that was that everything that they did was specified, and they became essentially the people that turned on the lights or made sure that the thermostats were working or poured the feed, and that was their value to the system. And an economist would say that means they're doing menial wage work, so they deserve nothing but menial wage, and that explains why we have the present structure of agriculture. Agricultural economists, by the way, would say that at land-grant universities, set up to serve farmers. So uh, appreciate that, let that sink in. Now, so that's the way that that would look. Now let's come back uh, to this. One other way in which that scenario might actually be fulfilled is for either the input or the marketing sector, or both, to say, let's just completely integrate this system, and let's just take over that production system. But, you know, that production system, that's the one where you go out and you have spent tremendous inputs on the machinery, uh, tremendous amounts of dollars on the machinery, on the seeds, on the chemicals, 
and in a 30 second tornado, it could disappear. Or a two minute hail, it could disappear. There's no such thing as going back to the seed seller and say, I had a tornado, I need my money back. You've paid your money. So the private sector is not gonna take that risk. You can have that risk. As a matter of fact, all of us, whether we're farmers or not, we take that risk. Because if you're in commodity programs, we make you whole in that situation. And if the market doesn't bear up, we make you whole. So ultimately, the money is flowing through that sector, and the folks who benefit are the input folks that always will have a market to sell their stuff, and the folks in marketing who will always be able to buy stuff, because there will not be a phenomenon where the input sector says, you know, that market is risky, some years it's good, some years it's bad, let's not invest in better seeds or in better chemicals or in better technology, and the whole system would fall apart. So there is a logic that most of us with sitting within the production sector oftentimes are not either thinking deeply about or in the worst of cases not even uh, aware of. So this obtains the mythology that we all need to take into account when we think of what, about what might be better. So at least the farmers being invisible as we've seen, just input providers and devalued. The former Secretary of Agriculture uh, was a staunch defender of farmers. Um, there's so much more to say to qualify to that, but I believe that he genuinely wanted to defend farmers. And he had a very effective stump speech that he did when he was speaking to non-farming audiences, which I loved to hear. And I'm going to ask him to help us out with just a little snippet of, of a much broader point that he usually made about this, where he describes who farmers are to people to whom farmers are just cartoons that once in a while appear uh, in newspaper stories. So uh, let me invite the secretary to explain. I this hope that you. folks would understand uh, the situation of the American farmer. And I don't expect you necessarily to be totally sympathetic, but I want you to know who these people are. You know, for the most part, um, there are about 2.2, 2.3 million people that are characterized or qualify as farmers under our survey at USDA. It only takes uh, the ability to raise about $1,000 of product for sale to be a quote unquote farmer. About 1.3 million of that 2.2, 2.3 million are folks who are doing something in the back of their home out in a rural area. Uh, they may be growing some strawberries, they may be uh, growing some apples that they turn into cider and every year they take it down to the farmer's market for a couple months they sell a couple thousand bucks worth of stuff and, and it's a good thing that, that that's taking place, but they're not making any money off this. They're just doing it because they enjoy doing it. So that leaves about a million people uh, that we, uh, if you went out and talked to the person on the street would ask, you know, you know, define for me a family farmer. That's probably, they're probably talking about these people that do farming, if you will, for a living. Of that number, about 700,000 of that number are small to medium sized operators. Uh, who sell less than $250,000 worth of product. In the best times we've had in agriculture, in the last six or seven years, record exports, uh, in some, uh, in some day, uh, years, record income, these folks averaged about $10,000 from their farming operation. $10,000. Which means that the vast majority of that six, 700,000 folks, they are working on the farm. They're working off the farm and their spouse is working on the farm and off the farm. They struggle, but they love the land, they're connected to the land, and they wanna stay in the land, and we wanna help them. And then you've got the other two to 300,000 that are commercial-sized operations, and you know they're doing pretty well. Okay, I wanna call your attention to that last line. And then there's these 200 to 300,000 farmers, they're doing pretty well, they're actually making it. So, in summary, you all know the statistic that's thrown about. It's actually uh, a very poor statistic to repeat after, after you've heard this from the Secretary of Agriculture that there's 2.2 million farmers in the country. Well, as you heard him say, about a million of them are not trying to make it in agriculture. Without repeating what he has said, uh, there is a small proportion of the total farming population that's generating the majority of agricultural output underscore output, not all of it is food. Uh, that means that the production capacity of U.S. agriculture is huge. 
The problem is over uh, production, not the need to produce more. We're trying to sop up production capacity by coming up with alternative markets, uh, by coming up with alternative uses. So that will be an important point to remember when thinking about how this system might be rewired. But in the meantime, what we end up with is a system where, to summarize the data that the secretary just uh, went through for us, you have here a chart that shows the way that farms are distributed in terms of percentage when you take a look at the first set of bars here. And you see the categories in terms of number of acres, smaller on your left, larger over to the right. And then when you take a look at the green bars, the other aspect that he was referring to, and this is the number of uh, acres in terms of percentage, if you just take a look at the last three columns there, the summary of that is that about 11% of the nation's farmers are operating over 70% of the nation's land. And there's lots of comments to make uh, about this. Um, you know, this is going to be directly proportional to where the income is accumulated in the concentration of both earnings and wealth in the agricultural and the uh, production sector. But it is also a picture of the poverty of imagination of the human skills, wisdom, and entrepreneurship across that entire spectrum of farming that often reduces to your two choices in agriculture. Either you recognize that you're in a commodity market selling low value inputs for the industry and therefore you need large acres. Just two weeks ago in this very state over in the northeastern part of the country, somebody looked at me straight in the eye and said, I need at least 10,000 acres in order to make it. Or the opposite of that saying, the alternative to that is you find some really high cash value crop. Maybe hemp is gonna be at this time and small acres will allow you to make it. And that's it, those are your options. Which one of those two are you? So that's a poverty of the imagination. If we take seriously how we can rewire the system, the assets that are to hand can be reconfigured in lots of better ways than those two uh, false alternatives that, that we often confront. Now, there's something else that the secretary could have said and, uh, and that I'm actually gonna spend the rest of this talk doing. And let, let me preface this by saying that this may be a difficult conversation and I don't want it to be a difficult conversation. There, there are, I'm gonna give you at least three reasons why it should not be a difficult conversation. But another characteristic of US agriculture is that it is a white occupation, no qualifications. It is a white occupation. So let me show you some data from the Department of Labor. And this is just looking at the upper 90% of consistent uh, occupational um, uh, endeavors uh, classified by ethnicity. So you see here that farmers and ranchers are 96% white. There's only one other vocation that is whiter and that is veterinarians. And you, I'm sure, will excuse me if I lump the two of those together and say that this is the single whitest occupation that there is according to the Department of Labor. I'm looking out on a room that is white. So, you know, there's no controversy around the factuality of what I'm telling you here. Now, that is not a natural outcome given the demographic makeup of this country, even going back to the time when it was established. This is not a natural outcome. It's an unnatural outcome. So understanding this, I promise you, will tie into why the system is not working well, underscore, for no one is working poorly for almost the majority of people involved here, except you heard there's 200 to 300,000 people in production agriculture for whom it goes well, and then the folks in the industry, the agribusiness sector, who benefit from that kind of system that essentially squeezes the supply chain. Now, uh, I told you that I'd uh, give you several different reasons why uh, I don't want this to be a difficult conversation. That is, if we don't have this conversation, then we can't rewire the system the way that it actually needs to be rewired so that it works best for everyone. Uh, according to the roles that we've historically played in agriculture, we can be in exactly the same location talking about exactly the same issues and have dramatically different experiences and therefore completely different views about what we ought to do to review, to rewire the system. And so let me just uh, give you a couple of facts here um, about why I want this to be a conversation where no one shuts down on me and we're all in the thought together. 
So uh, if you'll give me just uh, 60 seconds of, an, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of opportunity to talk to you about personal family history, hear mom and dad. Uh, mama is a Flemish American woman uh, who was part of a generation of Arkansas refugees from the 1930s depression who went and settled in the central coast of California. And they were agriculturists and made it really big in dairy uh, farming on the central coast produced their alfalfa in the Central Valley. Um, she is uh, the saintliest woman that I know, went to Bible school, became a missionary, went to Mexico as a missionary. There she made my dad, Native American man from Oaxaca, Mexico. So when I grew up, I saw both of their worlds simultaneously. I was part of both families. So, uh, feel free to laugh at, at this line. I understand whiteness. I've, I've been in that family. I've been in those churches singing how you know, great thou art. Um, I know what those prayers sound like. I know the worldview. I understand it completely. And likewise, I've sat around the kitchen, the fire uh, at my grandma's down in Oaxaca and understand that worldview perfectly. Um, and one thing that was very clear to me, by the way, both of these were farming families, but there was a clear difference that I saw, which was that the farmers on my mom's family would hire farmers like I had on my dad's side of the family to do the Nino work for them in California, because they eventually went on the, the migrant trail. And I saw that they were folks that talked about exactly the same values. I kid you not, the same dialogue in Zapotec and the same dialogue in English when it came to their families, same ambitions for their kids, they were just as entrepreneurial, just as hardworking, according to the Department of Labor that has a statistics that they call the labor occupancy rate. Nobody in this country works harder than farm workers. And if you hire farm workers, you know that yourself. You don't need a statistic. So I grew up seeing that, and it became clear to me, not immediately. It took me a while to figure it out. And as a matter of fact, I'm an agronomist now because I was too late in terms of figuring this out. But depending on who they were, where they were born, these families would have completely different fates, completely different spans of possibility available to them for what a historian would call structural reasons. I was too young to figure this out when I was growing up, but I want you to feel comfortable with the things that I'm going to say from somebody that's not on the attack against anyone, but from someone that's been inside of this and understands it from that standpoint, or at least I'm trying to figure it out from that standpoint. So we're going to talk about race, if you haven't figured this out. So another reason why I want this to be an easy conversation, I just want to get out of the way, and that is that uh, my friends, my white audience uh, sitting in front of me, uh, kind of wondering where this is going. You did nothing but be born in this generation. That's all you know. You're also trying to figure things out. So I know that. So the decisions that all of us here today will make about the world that we want in the future, that's what's going to create that future, and that's what this conversation is about. So I want to make that clear. Now, the last thing that I hope will make this an easy conversation to have about race is that that concept is a made-up thing. It does not exist. Um, now, I hope that doesn't confuse uh, anyone, so I'm going to call in some help from the folks that actually study humans. Uh, this is a statement issued uh, for reasons that were prominent in headlines uh, around identity wars uh, just this year by the American Association of Physical Anthropology. So they just felt it incumbent on them to issue a statement on race. So let me do something horrible to you, which is to read something to you. But I think this is important for all of us to go through like the preacher does and read the doxology. So they stated, race does not provide an accurate representation of human biological variation. It was never accurate in the past, and it remains inaccurate when referencing contemporary human populations. There, there is one human race on the planet, and the biological definition is we're an interbreeding race. Now, uh, in a period of about 40,000 to 70,000 years ago, uh, there may have been as, four, uh, as many as four or five human races living simultaneously in different parts of the planet. The Denisovans uh, in Central Asia, Flores uh, man, uh, Busan man in the Philippines, Anderthals uh, in Europe, and essentially the branch of the family that 
that we're from, that had migrated from Africa into Europe and was invading the territory of both the Neanderthal and the Denisovans. So at that time, there were several different human races, homo, uh, around the planet. But ours, Sabians, is the only one that remained after about 40,000 years ago. So if you're, we're asking questions about that, this is what the American Association of Physical Anthropology uh, statement is about. Now, following on this, they say humans, that's, so that's us, homo sapiens, are not divided biologically into distinct continental types or racial genetic clusters. Most of us confuse this because, of course, depending on what part of the planet we've been on for the last 10,000 years, yeah, we have skin adaptations, for instance, uh, to the place where we were in the amount of solar radiation we need to be protected against. But instead, they say, the Western concept of race was a useful tool. It must be understood as a classification system that emerged from and in support of European colonialism, oppression, and discrimination. Now, this next uh, passage is the punchline. It does not have its roots, this concept of race, in biological reality, but actually because it was a useful tool. It was used to justify discrimination. And so because of that, over the last five centuries, so it's the period of European colonization around the entire planet, race has become a social reality in its structured societies and how we experience the world. Now, underscore this last part here. This is really important for how, at least I'm going to speak. In this regard, race is real as is racism, and both have real biological consequences. So I've dragged you through all of this to explain why, in spite of the fact that there is no anthropological, genetic, or biological basis for the notion of race among the human species, because of the fact that we behave as it is and we mark it by skin color, it might as well be real. We act and have created realities in the world based on that attitude or that worldview. It's a very instrumental view, and I'm going to underscore that several times before we're done here. Now, racism. I'll give you my definition of this. It's basically on this false premise that we've described the notion that if you look at me, and as humans are really good at this, you think you know anything about me because you know my race. That's racism. So, and you see it's not a complicated uh, definition. I, let me just give you one illustration, and I, I'm going to paint so that this is not uncomfortable for, for everyone. If I haven't shared my personal history, I can tell you something that happens to me very often. And that is that I'll often say when people ask me where I'm about, I'll say, oh, my, my mom was an immigrant, and they put that together with the fact that my last name is Salvador, and they imagine there's some story about having crossed the river at some point, and here I am. And nobody could possibly imagine that it was my mom who immigrated to Mexico, for all intents and purposes, became Mexican. She, I mean, she legally migrated to Mexico, speaks Spanish like a native. And because she was born in the United States, as you all know, every child of a US citizen uh, has the right to US citizenship. So I'm a US citizen. And that's usually why the question comes up. People are trying to figure that out. You know, how'd you get here? So I'm legal. So, uh, <laughs> It's just a, a surface illustration that a lot of us experience of what racism is and how it manifests in the real world, but that one is not this. There are much darker consequences of that. Now, let's jump into this. And it may seem like this is a complete departure. I hope to put these three threads together for you by the time this is done. I want to talk to you about the way in which we build wealth. And this, you could get if you just went into the first chapter of your economics textbook, uh, from college, this is orthodox economics. This is not economics according to me, or me in concerned time. I just want to make sure that, because I know that usually when you take this course as students, it's not the most scintillating subject matter, but I refresh you on what's in that chapter, because it forms the conceptual foundations of how we claim that we act in the world. So according to economic theory, there are three ways that we build wealth, through a concept that economists uh, call uh, the factors of production. So there are three factors of production. So the first factor of production is land. So land belongs, according to economists, to the first sector of the economy. You begin to build wealth by acquiring land, and then you produce food on that land, you cut the timber that's on that land, you extract the minerals that are on that land. All economies are built on that extractive first tier process. The second factor of production is labor. That's how you turn the stuff that that land gives you access to into what economists call capital. 
Now, capital can be financial capital. That's what most of us uh, would be thinking about. But capital to economists basically is anything that has value to us and that we exchange among each other. That's what capital is. So you take land, apply labor and entrepreneurship to that, you generate capital that we exchange among each other. And probably one of the high points of economic theory is this notion that uh, many economists refer to as Ricardo's beautiful idea. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about David Ricardo, who is a Scottish economist, who, by the way, had that name because his family fled as refugees. They were Jews, and they fled uh, Portugal as refugees during the Inquisition period. So David Ricardo's beautiful idea, uh, articulated in the 18th century, around the time that this nation was becoming, um, is the notion that if we all specialize in that scheme that you see there, land, labor, capital, in the different places on the planet where we are, and do the things that we're the best at in that part of the planet, and then exchange among each other, that, that we're all better off. That's a lesson that our economist in chief in the White House, as Senator Tesco was talking about, has difficulty with at the moment, but that's the economic theory, that to prepare to the advantage, that we all are better off. So this is Orthodox Economics 101. I just want to rehearse that for you in order to say that if we were perverse, if you actually wanted people not to build wealth because you wanted that wealth, you would make sure that they didn't have access to back of their production. Land, labor, capital. If you were perverse. So given that those factors would disappear, you would be having nothing to trade, you could be the most hardworking entrepreneurial person on the planet with no land, with labor that's not recognized or remunerated appropriately, you're not an economic agent. So, here's the background. And, uh, you know, it, it probably is a dead giveaway to everything that's following here, but I just want to apply those principles to the real world and talk about poverty. So I want to show you a graph here that uh, comes from the Census Bureau. And it will show you how race is distributed demographically and then broken down by ethnicity. So the population is just a little bit over 60% whites. Only about 1.2% the first peoples of this continent. About 13% African American, about 18% is goulash, the people of this kind. Um, so the first thing to notice about this is that when you compare the poverty rates, there is quite poverty. That's the first thing to note. You notice that it runs at 9%. When you compare the poverty rate of uh, Hispanics and African Americans, you notice that it's roughly twice the white poverty rate. And when you compare it to the poverty rate that exists among First Peoples, you see that it approximates three times the poverty rate. Now, given what we just rehearsed from chapter one of the economics textbook, this should not be surprising when you think about the ties of each of these demographic groups to factors of production. But the thing that I'll just say right now before coming back to this is that these are disproportionate rates of poverty according to ethnicity, this false concept of race. How does this come to be? How do we come to have, in our particular sector of the economy, a 96% white occupation and then this distribution of poverty when if it were not for the fact that the land was the first peoples, that the labor is provided by the African American and Hispanic population, the system would implode. So that's the thing that I want to walk through. Remember, what I'm trying to get to is how can we rewire this so it's a system that's better for all of us. I'm going to be scoring all. Okay, now, um, let's talk about factor production number one access to land. Uh, this is a poster of the sort that uh, forebears in this part of the country would have seen and acted upon in order to come upon their land. Uh, you remember the Act of 1862 that Lincoln signed, the uh, Homestead Act, that essentially promised families that they can have a quarter of a section of land if they would make it productive, and of course, no need to verify that. You just simply cross the Mississippi and acquire that land while it was plentiful. But that land wasn't just sitting there, that land had been peopled. And so I want to show you a couple of things about this uh, graph. There's the obvious advertising aspect of it. You know, this is either irrigated or irrigable land. You can use it for grazing and for agricultural and dry farming. Notice that the authority is the Secretary of the Interior and the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. 
So, take a look at this. They have boldly advertising that this is Indian land for sale. There was a campaign that preceded the justifications for applying the vast majority of the continental the United States during the colonization period under a set of doctrines that evolved over about three centuries but are collectively called the doctrines of discovery. We can spend a lot of time reviewing papal bulls and documents uh, issued by courts in Europe to understand those doctrines of discovery. Let me summarize it for you. It, it essentially, you can read a lot and you'll end up seeing that what they said was, I give myself permission to take your land because I'm Christian and you're not. So the doctrines of discovery boil down to that. That's the justification. I'll uh, say so a little bit more about that in just a little bit. But the concerted effort to consummate the land grab gave us one of the seven agricultural basins uh, on the planet in this country was actually called directly the Indian Wars. Uh, kicked off in 1830 under President Andrew Jackson with an act of Congress called the Indian Removal Act. That Congress was not confused about what it meant to do with that act. They stated directly what they intended to do. And there was a six decade period moving people from the southeastern portion of the country in a wave across the entire country. This is documentation from what was then called the Department of the Army of over 250 battles and massacres, with the majority of them being massacres. Uh, you will be familiar with those that are placed in the present state of Montana. But I want to underscore two aspects of this. It was consummated both uh, literally and symbolically by the massacre of Wounded Knee in 1890. So remember, the Indian Removal Act signed in 1830, the massacre of Wounded Knee in 1890. This massacre occurred in the winter of that year when the gentleman who you see here frozen in death, not in River Mortis, but frozen, and then left out there three days before the army figured out what they would do with all the people that had been massacred from there. It happened because of the fact that there was a pioneer holy man who was traveling around the West at a time when Native peoples had been deprived of everything that they understood about the way that the world worked and their culture, their language, their food system, preaching that if people would dance in circles, peacefully, singing, and dancing was called the ghost dance, that the good times would return. So this band was doing this in the middle of the winter. The colonel in charge that would have made the spooks and had all these women and children and old men killed. So where I want to go with this is not only to recognize that this was the consummation of the Indian Wars that led to posters such as Indian Land for Sale uh, all over the place. I'll just give you a footnote here. Last December, I went to a meeting just outside of Kansas City and walked into the restroom of the homeless head where we were having a meeting, and there was a poster very much like that commemorating how that man was coming to their land. The actual thing. So, as you saw in that statement from the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, this notion of race has a great utility. So, when we need somebody else's land, we need justification. And so, here's an example of the thinking in the middle of the 1800s when we were in the heart of those Indian wars. The Indians were ignorant, abject, and debased by nature, whose minds are as incapable of instruction as the bodies are of labor. They have nothing in common with humanity but the form. And God has sent us to destroy them as he did to the Israelites of old, to similar tribes. So remember the connection to the doctrines of discovery. We're Christian, you're not. You're savages. So the Indian Wars were consummated, fueled by this sort of thinking. And uh, before the signing of 1830, uh, Indian removal legislation. This, of course, has been going on even back to the 18th century and the original colonization in the Northeast. But I want to underscore this because it is factor of production number one for how we all go with wealth. I don't want to gloss over it. None of us should gloss over it because we're all benefiting from this at the moment. And so I want to read to you from Article 2 of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which was issued after the Second World War because of the genocide of campaign that was at the heart of the Second World War. We were fighting against genocide there. And the irony was that, as you know, famously, Hitler, the person responsible for that genocide of Jews, stated that he took his model for how to get rid of the Jewish population from what he had seen Americans do with the native population in the United States, a genocide of campaign. That was his example. 
So let me walk through each of these five criteria for how you recognize that genocide has occurred. So we start with the most obvious one. This one requires no explanation. You kill members of the group. I talked about wounded knee and three days to figure out what to do with the body. Well, dig a big trench in the frozen ground, throw everybody in there, and basically he has waste for his refuge. And it will remind you, ironically, of the depravity that we were fighting in the Second World War, exactly the same sort of genocide against different people on a different continent. You recognize the equation of two enemies. Now, number one is relatively easy both to document and to understand. Let's take a look at number two, which is causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. So this is a quotation from Lord Jeffrey Amherst, uh, who actually is honored to this day with the college named Yachtman in the Northeast. He instructed one of his colonels in the field, you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate this execrable race. And so there was a purposeful, intentional effort to cause serious bodily or mental harm by making people ill or by removing their entire food system and the source of medicine, the source of clothing, the very heart of culture. You all know, because I know you remember this from your history, that it was an intentional culture to say it's going to be far more effective than to try to eliminate the vermin to eliminate their food supply. Language and thought of the whole time. So criterion number two, if I recognize the genocide, is amply fulfilled. Criterion number three is to deliberately inflict on the group conditions of life that are calculated to bring about physical destruction. So imagine, you have no access to your language, your culture. You're punished if you speak your own language, if you don't understand that, that reference. To your own culture, all the artifacts of your culture, your food system, your clothing, your religious practices, these are looked up on eliminated. And you're really dependent on commodity food, which are essentially the dregs of the, the food system. If you want to see some of the most ill people on the planet, and some of the most immiserated people on the planet due to the way in which we eat and to the economic opportunities available to them, go to Wounded Knee. Go to Pine Ridge. Go to the heart of the Diné Nation. I'm not saying the most immiserated people in the United States. If you've been there, you'll understand what I'm saying. The most immiserated people on the planet. Factor number one, production, was explicitly removed. Land. So, the deliberate inflicting on the group of conditions calculated to bring about physical destruction in the field that there's nothing I can do. I'm dependent. No matter what I try to do, I'm not allowed to do. There's no meaning to my life. Criteria number four, imposing measures intended to prevent the person of the group. Uh, since we failed to kill everyone off, uh, the original population at the time of colonization had been about 5 million people. At the consummation of the Indian Wars in 1890, those had been decimated. Uh, actually, it's a poor word to use for what happened. The population had been reduced by 95% to 250,000 survivors in 1890, out of the original 5 million. And so the next strategy was the strategy they were all familiar with to kill the Indian and save the man. And one of the tools was to transfer either to uh, adoption in homes or more popularly in boarding schools convert these folks into Christians. And in those schools, women, as young as teenagers, were forcibly sterilized, most often without them realizing what was actually happening to prevent them from reproducing. So imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. No special pleading in order to say that condition of genocide is fulfilled. And condition number five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Well, those boarding schools essentially did the job. This is a group of Chiricahua children just about four months after they arrived at the Carlisle Industrial Indian School in Pennsylvania. You can see the transformation in force uh, over a period of four years of education uh, before these folks were returned to their communities, hopefully as literally whitewashed individuals. One of the most striking examples of this is uh, uh, Mr. Torlino, who was Navajo. Uh, you can see the transformation. Now, I can imagine what's in the back of your mind as we rehearse uh, some of this. One can always say something like what actually the Dawes Act said uh, several decades after this period. Look, uh, you know, as long as you integrate, you know, adopt the language, our religion, become an industrious, educated, hardworking individual, you can enjoy all the benefits of this country. What is the problem? 
that's conquest. You can't be the original Mr. Torino. You need to be the cleaned up, whitewashed Mr. Torino on the right. Then it'll be okay. That's conquest. So, let me go back to just one last way of underscoring the impact of this. I mentioned the Cherry Cobbles. They were one of the last bands that resisted. They were led by an individual by the name of Tukukuts. The Mexicans against the Hunos, uh, they also fought, called Tukukuts Jeronimo. And Jeronimo is in this image on the bottom right, third from the right. And this image is in Oklahoma as they were getting ready to ship them out to Florida, the last desperate effect to uh, attempt to pacify them because these people would escape and continue to resist. The last desperate measure was to send to Hukuts' band uh, resistance warriors to, to Florida. Now, just uh, about two years ago, you all recall the resistance to the XL pipeline, which is an effort to say if this pipeline is going across our land, we have a right to say that this pipeline should go across this line and we're interested in protecting our water. You'll notice that for the native population, not much has changed. Things look the same if you're trying to defend your land and your rights. So let's conclude chapter number one of talking about factor production number one, how we make ourselves rich, which is access to land, by underscoring this, a reality of our history that we're all benefiting from right now. Gen O side. Intentional Jim both side and land grab. Five million people to 250,000 people. Now, I should end this uh, by telling you this population has rebounded to five million people. You know many of them in Montana. You know that a lot of the desperation that ensues from not having any path to follow if you want to remain true to who you are, and the only alternative is to be absorbed into something that is as foreign as can be, can create despair. And you know folks are trying to figure out a middle way. And there's particularly a group that I admire, which is called the Illuminated. Illuminated wants you to think of them as people that are trying to be victorious in the almost impossible set of circumstances so that they don't want you to feel sorry for them, but they will appreciate allyship in the form of stop telling lies about the story and recognize what it is and no longer be in their way as they seek to fully reestablish themselves. Now, let's go to chapter number two of Landgrave. So, as you know, over half of the uh, territorial of the United States had been in the position of another country. I'm not going to spend a whole lot about this. Uh, as you may have picked up if you weren't uh, uh, in the days when I stated this. I grew up in Mexico, born and raised and was educated in Mexico. This is a key part of our history. And it was a shock to me when I got to the United States that almost no one has heard of the Mexican American War or understands what it is. But it is why this state is called Montana del Norte. I mean, you would say Montana, but you know, the Spaniards had named it this. And it is why there are major states that are called things such as Colorado, Red Earth, Nevada, Snowy, Arizona, Hot Place, why there's major cities that are called San Antonio, El Paso, Santa Fe, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, and so on. That place had been Mexico for hundreds of years. It's only been part of the United States, New Mexico and Arizona, since 1912. That land grab had a very explicit purpose uh, as well. It was conducted by President James Polk. Uh, you may have picked up in Bruce's introduction that the longest I've lived anywhere at, in my life has been in Iowa. And uh, Des Moines is located in Polk County because Iowa became a state in 1946, the year of the Mexican-American War. So they named counties after significant leaders of the Mexican-American War or significant battles. So there's Palo Alto, there's Cerro Gordo, I recognize those. Nobody in Iowa knows what that's uh, about. But President Polk said that it was of great importance to our country, generally and especially to our navigating and whaling interests, that the Pacific Coast and indeed the whole of our territory west of the Rocky Mountains should speedily be filled up by a hearty and patriotic country, because they were replacing Catholics. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but this entire chapter is the chapter that fulfilled that notion that you all are familiar with of manifest destiny. 
And, and this graphic, which illustrates enough that we could be here for an hour breaking it down, you see whiteness migrating from one side to the other, replacing darkness. And the darkness do not miss the estimated population, wildlife, and the food supply disappearing, being replaced by farmers, railroads, stagecoaches, telegraph lines, modern access to the rest of the world and trade, civilization. So it's very clear what the world view was that was being propounded by this. Let's talk about factor production number two. This is labor. The main agricultural occupation of the United States um, during the majority of its history for centuries were large scale crops that required some of the most brutal menial labor imaginable. So sugar cane, in turn tobacco, in turn rice, in turn cotton, prior to mechanization. Meaning that owners of the vast tracts of land necessary to produce these commodity crops, they were commodity crops even at that time, because low value, the value was in the mercantile exchange, uh, was not going to be performed by the owners. So they entered into global trade agreements with slave traders who abducted individuals, entire families, sometimes entire communities from the western coast of Africa, and brought them across the ocean under some of the most brutal conditions manageable, specifically so that they could provide the group labor force uh, for the United States in those crops that I mentioned. And in order to keep them enslaved, families were separated so that languages couldn't be preserved and people couldn't plot uh, with each other to rise up. Um, they were terrorized, they were brutalized, they were treated as animals, obviously treated as property. Uh, even after emancipation, we specifically excluded them from participating in the benefits of the wealth that their labor had helped to create, because the industrial United States would not have been possible without the platform created by exporting tobacco, sugar, rice, and cotton. But they were not going to be participating in the benefit. Now, I'm going to make a claim by the time that I'm done about one way that we could have done things at this time in the 1860s at the consummation of the Civil War that would have given us a dramatically different um, uh, future. And let me lay the foundation for that statement here. At this time, pictured here, post-Civil War, the nation's agricultural expertise was concentrated in the African-American population. For the reasons that I just stated, remember, 1860s, the Homestead Act was brand new. The Midwest and this part of the country had not been settled yet. That was the process that was taking place. The Northwest was referring to the corner that was on the other side of the Mississippi at that time. And so the folks that knew most about agriculture because they produced all those commodity crops, and you can believe were also producing the food crops for all the plantations, were the African American slave laborers of these places. So one thing that we could have done if we had been logical and analytical is to say, there's this tremendous pool of expertise, we are stealing all of this land, and we need to populate it. Who knows the most? We're establishing schools of agriculture. Who should be the faculty of those schools? Who knows the most? I don't know the way that I could have answered if this had been a logical decision at that time, but we did not do that. And the consequences of that was that we continued to build wealth, and that population lost their wealth. Now, the methods that we utilized in order to continue to enforce that extraction of wealth continued to be brutal uh, during this uh, period of time, and we have been very adept to the present moment, sending the signal that says, we built this for us. This is not for you. If you recognize what you're reading in headlines, we send the signal daily. Clearly, we send the signal. And so, some of the rawest episodes of how we did this uh, during the Jim Crow era, you may believe, are in our deep past and uh, that we've become a better nation than this. I can assure you that in the African American population, they've experienced no such thing. It is still possible these days that for the silliest of infractions, it essentially translate to you exceeded your bounds. Uh, you can not only be put in your place, you can lose your life over a of things. But to Mr. Rashad Davis here, being assaulted in Ferguson, Missouri, for the crime of walking home from home while black. And you see here, it's, it's too painful to go through examples from recent headlines up until just two weeks ago. 
where an African American woman can be killed in her own home for the crime of playing video games with her niece while leaving her door open. That will be too killed. So it's very clear that lesser, the different value that's placed on this population that is here because of agriculture. The reason they were here to begin with and their descendants are here is because of agriculture and the food system. And they have been replaced by folks who will tell you slavery has not disappeared, it is just evolved. We perform it with much more finesse at the moment. And if that sounds mysterious, then let me just walk you through a few facts about these folks. The farm workers, of course, you will find concentrated where we produce fruits, vegetables, dairy, and where we pack and process meat and eggs. So you will find these folks concentrated in all these parts of the country where these activities take place. And they are folks who are actually excluded from the benefits uh, that we all would consider to be just obvious and natural rights of our occupations and encoded in occupational safety and uh, health uh, or uh, hazard protection. So they obviously work outdoors, exposed to the elements, exposed to some of the most toxic chemicals that we've manufactured. Remember, a lot of those in their ancestry in uh, chemical warfare uh, in the First and Second World Wars. But it's notable that these folks are not protected, not only for that, but also they're not entitled to workman's compensation. They don't get overtime. If you want to talk about benefits such as retirement or medical, that's a laughable proposition. Now here, I can imagine people might at least wonder about that. But in places where these folks are concentrated, California, Florida, and the Northeast, if you raise that possibility, you would laugh out of the house. And we know exactly what we're doing. I can tell you that because of the fact that the reason why these folks have, don't have those protections is that there are exemptions. All the rest of us have the protections that I just listed. But these folks are exempted. Specifically, in two major labor laws, these folks are exempted. So we know exactly what we're doing. Uh, one of the things that uh, are exi uh, is exempt in those laws is specifically the fact that whereas your children need to be in school, in this population, their children can be in the field as young as 12. That's an exemption to labor. So we know exactly what we're doing, and we know exactly when we're doing it, too. Now, the reason for that, just in case you're, you're wondering, is that one thing that might have happened, going back to economic principles after emancipation, is to say, you know, we've been extracting wealth from labor. We haven't been paying the worth of that labor that is added up to our wealth. So now that we're no longer enslaving people, now we will begin paying fair price for the labor that slaves formerly performed. That's what we might have done. And of course, we didn't know such thing. That's why we have these exemptions to the laborers they currently perform what formerly enslaved people might have done. So that's production, processing, serving, cleaning up afterwards. Now, when it comes to pricing labor, there's a few criteria that you might use, but one of them is, what if we didn't have this labor? What would we have to pay to replace it? So that, that means that if this labor pool disappeared, farms wouldn't work, dairies wouldn't work, restaurants wouldn't work, the food system would work, and we don't need it. Full stop, there's no qualification to that. So their value is incalculable on those criteria, and you'll be paid nowhere near that. As a matter of fact, it seems to be very convenient that we can terrorize them with immigration policies, and I'm gonna come back and talk to you about that. But for now, I'm just gonna underscore the point that this is a population that is exploited to extract wealth. And we have justifications for that, just as we justified land acquisition by saying that we were just replacing savages. So let's talk about this. So it's really a sad commentary uh, when a comedian has such accurate social commentary as I'm going to need to do here. Chris Rock said this about the food system. I used to work in McDonald's, making minimum wage. You know what that means when somebody pays you a minimum wage? What they're trying to tell you is this. It's like, hey, if I could pay you less, I would. But it's against the law. So this is what the picture that I've just drawn from you uh, means. Now, I promise you that I'd come back to you and talk to you about justifications based on race and how that 
ties up to who built the wealth and who doesn't build wealth in this country. So we have fine, facile explanations. You know, some of us are more entrepreneurial. Some of us work hard. We pull that stuff up from our bootstrap. We have all kinds of stories to explain why some of us are rich, some of us are poor. The science of economics uh, is a social science. It differs from what are called the hard sciences, which, by the way, that doesn't refer to how difficult they are. It refers to how predictable they are, how repeatable they are. So there are such things as the gravitational con uh, constant, speed of light, those sorts of things, which any observer with the appropriate tools and preparation would conclude have a certain value. They don't change. They're facts in the universe. But economics is a science that we made up, straight out of our heads. We can point to when we made it up in the 1700s. We can point to how we've changed our minds about different so-called laws and economics. So we can decide how we want the economic system to work. Now, I needed to say that in order to deal with this issue of immigration and uh, the labor force. Um, so remember, we've justified genocide and land grabs by saying those were savages. We justified enslavement by saying those folks are not fully human. I won't go to the Jewish uh, uh, law. Um, and what are we saying to justify extraction of wealth from the foreign labor force? What are we saying? The majority of them, you know, they're not evil. So I'm going to talk to you about that. Here are some of the economic rules that we've changed within my lifetime. So capital can flow freely across borders. You can buy a banana plantation in Costa Rica today. Somebody in Hong Kong can buy a farm in Montana today. Capital can flow across borders freely. Manufacturers, the capital that I described earlier, that can flow across borders freely. We exchange all the time. Uh, I wouldn't be able to make electrons jump through hoops and show you pretty pictures if it weren't for the fact that we're doing it. And when it comes to labor, all of a sudden supply and demand don't work. So there is a demand for labor in this country which the domestic supply is not meeting. So by economic law, that would draw the labor supply from someplace else across the border and that should be as fine as capital and merchandise moving across the border to make the economy work. That's the rationale. But we say that's not illegal. And the beauty of it is that then the people that do it anyway, as we weep in order to make the system work, we can threaten, we can terrorize. Under a formal program, it's called the Domestic uh, Working Program, it's to a, we actually do that. We import people who only have the freedom while they're here to build somebody else's wealth. And the way it looks like is they have housing, the only thing they can do is walk from that housing to milk cows or pick vegetables and when they're done, go back to that housing. Can't do anything else. By law. Now let me talk to you about that program specifically. I'm, I'm guessing, and, and uh, please forgive me if I'm victimizing you, there, there's other parts in the country that, where people depend more on that program than I'm guessing than people might hear. But, but even so, I guess you're familiar with the broad outlines of the H2A program. So I'm going to give you some statistics that are official statistics, which means that they're under-representation, they're underestimation, because when it comes to um, illegal immigration, as defined by the very concept, we don't really know. But here are some good approximations that we use for official purposes. So we say that in agriculture, there's a demand for a million farm laborers per year that are not met by domestic supply. That's what we say. Now, we import 55,000 guest workers through that H2A program under the conditions that I've just described. You must, in order to qualify to have guest workers, prove to the Department of Labor that no one is answering your job postings where you are. You first of all, have to document that. So you can imagine the paperwork and the headache that it is for people that are trying to produce fruits and vegetables or run a dairy farm to have to do that. So there are typically farmer associations that take care of this on a state basis. And so I'm going to give you some data that comes from a study of this in uh, fruit, vegetable, hog, and poultry intensive state, which is North Carolina. And this is a study that was performed not too long ago that you can look up if you're interested in the specific statistics. It's called International Harvest. 
So let me just summarize for you the main findings of this. So for the state of North Carolina, the first thing that you need to do is to understand what the demand for labor there is that they're not meeting by people within North Carolina saying, yes, I'll apply for that farm job. It's 6,500 people. Okay? Now, in this graph, what I'm going to show you from the period of 98 to 2012 is a comparison of the number of unemployed people in North Carolina. Now, that means the people who could, in theory, say, I don't have a job, here's this job on a farm, I'll sign up for that. That's the pool, the domestic pool. Now, I want to point out something about that column. It's disproportionate to every other column in that graph. It's in hundreds of thousands. The others are the actual absolute numbers that you see. So we have a pool of 141,000 in 1998 who could apply for 6,500 farm jobs. Of those, there are 112 workers that are referred by employment agencies. And of those, 14 actually report to work. And of those, none complete the season. So then under those conditions, you can import the domestic workers. Okay? So notice that if I had actually scaled this proportionately, you wouldn't see those last three columns. They disappear completely. There are you know, a few orders of magnitude difference on that scale. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens over that period of time. So this happened to coincide with the economic uh, bust of the late 1990s. So the pool of unemployed people, of course, balloons. It goes up. The number of referred workers modestly increases. And they report the work in the number of 143 against a need of 6,500. And 10 people actually complete the season. So factor production number one, acquisition of land. Factor production number two, labor. After we rehearse these things, and you take a look at this graph, I hope it has a completely different meaning. I hope it has a completely different rationale and explanation for why we have disproportionate rates of poverty when we break down the population unnaturally on this funky statistic of race. So the answer to the question is that some of us built this system for ourselves, not for everyone else. The rest of us are here because we either were at the time or were now the descendants of people that provided menial labor or who were nuisances and obstacles to get the land on which to perform the economic activity that today we call farming. So that's the explanation of this graph. Some of us built wealth. Some of us created institutions where we could learn to build wealth. Some of us went to institutions that were the B team that didn't have the budget, didn't have the quality and faculty, didn't have the attention to create the opportunities. Some of us acquired land and credit in order to be able to build off of that land. Some of us were excluded from credit and loans and housing, and our poverty generation generationally has been diminished. All clearly documented in official records, we just need to accurately interpret the picture that's in front of us. So when you look at a graph like that, actually, can I ask you to go back to the our slide, sorry for having done that to you. Um, our uh, our poor uh, remote operator over here didn't sign up for this job this morning, as you know. When, I'm going to ask you something. Probably the only thing I would plead for you, the entire moment, and for honestly, I promise you, we're going to talk about how the system might be rewired. Um, do not look at graphs like this or allow in your presence if you follow what I'm saying. For the populations on the three right hand columns to be referred to as the less fortunate, the disadvantaged, the economically disadvantaged, or the socially disadvantaged, all these euphemisms that we use, that's not what happened to these people. These are people whose land was taken, whose ancestors were killed, whose labor was stolen, to the present. Let's recognize that because without recognizing that, we can't make the appropriate change. If the decisions and the criteria and the values that we applied in the past continue to operate in the future, the future will be like the past. We don't want that, and that needs to change. If it is with that, we need to change our language that is more accurate. Okay, now, uh, this is something that I have to remark on, and it is that the system is described as not accidental. It was by design. If that's not clear, it's in the foundational documents of this nation. We have not actually resolved conflicts that the founding fathers, for all the brilliant things that they did, found too difficult to do. They were all slave holders, and they actually discussed at the time of the Declaration whether they should actually sell or give freedom to their slaves and write a document that would reflect their value. 
and they knew that against their values, they couldn't do it in their lifetimes. They hoped that generations after them could do that. And one of the ways that we know that is that they actually documented this. So you know this famous document in the third line that we hope is used to uh, be self-evident, that uh, all men are created equal. I'm not going to translate that into the modern alliteration that we would all use, which is all people were created equal. They meant all men were created equal, and it specifically meant all white landowning men. There was serious debate about those three criteria around that time. Now, how do we know that? Well, let me quote to you from Senator Stevens, who was Lincoln's opponent. So one of the branches of history that we're looking at, you saw everything Lincoln did as a result of getting in a position to do something about what he knew farmers endured in the 1840s and 1950s when he was growing up. So when he became president in 1960, he did something about those things. Um, if his opponent had won, Senator Douglas, let me just quote to you what he was saying on the stump at that period of time. In my opinion, this government of ours is founded on the white basis. It was made by the white men for the benefit of the white men to be administered by the white men. I am opposed to taking any step that recognizes the Negro man or the Indian as the equal of the white man. So, Senator Douglas was not confused. He was pretty plain about what he intended to do. Imagine the branch of history that would have ensued if he'd become the president. Sadly, people who speak this way fully into the first quarter of the 21st century and her state is still saying exactly this, might have written exactly this sort of thing, are getting called out of the White House. Some very fine people. At the present day, this hasn't been resolved. So, one of the ways in which we know what the intention was from the very beginning was all of the effort that it has taken to try to undo what the founders actually established in the 1770s. So, let me just go through this very quickly. You had to be a landlord. Those people did not trust, the people that did not have an education to make wise decisions for the nation. They didn't want you to vote. And the sign of being privileged and having criteria that they would respect were that you were gentry, that you were landlord. So that didn't end until a series of state-by-state state, uh, Supreme Court decisions that ended finally in 1856, when North Carolina was the last state to make it possible for white men to vote, even if they weren't landlord. So, similar thing, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which essentially sanctioned the results of that Mexican land grab, said that former citizens of Mexico could have citizenship without access to vote, and they needed to speak English. And they enforced this violently at the time, with trauma to the president, which means that a lot of folks with last names like Sanchez and Gutierrez can't speak a lick of Spanish. It was a survival technique on the part of their forebears. The 15th Amendment in 1870 said that non-white men and free slaves gained the franchise. These were nominal rights, because nobody could actually exercise these rights in the Jim Crow era. So, you keep on going, the Dobbs Act, which I promise you we we'll talk about later, said that Native Americans could have the right to vote as long as they were willing to disassociate from their tribe meaning acknowledging and conquered and vanquished. Then you can vote. Then you can be a citizen. So remember what I'm doing here is telling you why we know what the founders meant, because we had to work to undo what they put into the founding documents. So the 19th Amendment, here we are in 1919. 100 years ago, let me do a quick scan. Half of this room couldn't vote. You weren't citizens. We'll only celebrate the centenary of that, which, by the way, that was a struggle when this tribe took 100 years itself in order to be able to attain. So, let's go on to the Indian Citizenship Act. Native Americans were supposedly again granted citizenship and the right to vote, again, through a series of voter discrimination acts on reservations. This actually never actually was fulfilled. This is the second chapter of that. Here's the third chapter. After there was a public relations fiasco and essentially shame about the fact that Native Americans could not vote when Navajo wind talkers actually made it possible to win the Pacific Wars in the Second World War. Then, in a couple of court uh, trials in New Mexico, finally the right to vote was granted to Native Americans. So, 
third chapter of trying to give the right to vote to Native Americans. Took three efforts. The McCarran Walter Act in 1952, so this is getting to the point in time that I'm around, you know, the decade that I was born, that's actually when people of Asian ancestry finally acquired the right to vote in this country. As you know, it wasn't until 1965 when Jim Crow officially was eliminated, at least ostensibly, to correct and discriminatory election practices. Although we all live in an era right now where we're saying, well, that was a bit too much. We didn't really need to do that. And we're actually rolling back voters' rights and making it more difficult to vote. And there are voting officials who are very clear about saying it's because we don't want a particular vote in the poll. So when I say we know exactly what we're doing, this is what I'm referring to. Now, you've been very gracious and put up with a lot here in terms of history and you know, theory. I think it's necessary to do that in order for me to, to get to what I'm about to say and for it to be taken seriously. And that is that if you want to rewire the way the nation works, what Zach uh, said to us last night, first talk, those of you who were here, it's absolutely necessary. We can't be split against each other. We have to recognize that the wealth of this country was created collectively by all of us our land, our labor, our dreams, our entrepreneurship. And so, therefore, the wealth should be distributed collectively among us all. And if we recognize that, if we actually want to act on that, we actually need to undo. We can't just say, okay, well, let's act like the last 150 years and a half. We actually need to undo that. So I promise you that I'd come back and, and, uh, and finish up a statement that I started to make when it was relevant and the point of history that we were talking about. I can imagine a vision of the land grant schools when they were established uh, that would have been replete with African American faculty for the reasons that I stated in my book, and the Native American faculty. These days, we are uh, completely obsessed with the notion of sustainability in groups like Arrow and some other groups across the country. That's you know, the blue bubble that I operate in. And the deep insight that if you model agricultural systems on the native ecosystem that was here to begin with 160 years ago, at least in this part of the world, so that, for instance, you will allow natural processes to build up organic matter and fertility of soil, and you allow grasslands to uh, express, and then you have grazing animals turn that into something that's of economic value to us, that that is going to be resilient and that's going to last for a long time. That's an insight, ostensibly. Because that's the insight that the people who were here had to begin with. That was their food system. And you've got to admit that people who've been around for decades, or at most 160 years, should at least pay attention to what people who've been around for 10,000 years successfully have got to say about being sustainably on a piece of land. So those are arguments for who might have been teachers at schools of agriculture. But I further would suggest something like this. Um, what I would have done is to say that if these schools were set up for the benefit of the working class at that time, at the time they were called the industrial class, that's in the language of the moral act, but they meant the working class, you wouldn't say in a speech like what you heard the Secretary, Secretary Wilsack say, we are going to help you. We're going to create institutions of learning and education, we're going to create knowledge that you know, be more productive, we're going to help you, and the price of that is actually 95% of you need to go away. We're going to eliminate all of you. We're going to replace you with a drone, the GPS system, the machine. We have no value. It's cheaper for us to produce with artificial intelligence and technology. Um, and what if, that, that's actually what some scientists will generate. If you let scientists actually play with toys and become administrators and deans and presidents, that's what will happen. So what I would have done is to say that stuff is technology. It can solve problems. The people that can come up with that sort of stuff don't have the preparation and sometimes not even the worldview or the capacity to ask the really important question around science and technology. But those are social questions. They're these questions. Science is an epistemology. It's about what you want to know. So what do you want to know? Who wants to know? Why do they want to know? How are they going to use that knowledge? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to benefit? And are those two last the same people? Scientists aren't qualified to do all that. I would have had what today we call world sociologists actually be the administrators of language schools. And the technologists and the scientists to be subordinate to those folks. Because those are the folks that ask the question, is this decision going to produce the ultimate collective social good? 
If it is, we do it. If it's not, we pursue other alternatives. Because I can imagine alternatives that keep all the people on the land productive, producing for each other, exchanging land, labor, capital in a way that benefits everyone, rather than the price of concentrating wealth away from the community and eliminating people in the communities. We all must admit that we have the intelligence to come up with that alternative system. And institutions like this are the places where that sort of architecting can reoccur. So what I am suggesting, and I'll be really clear, is that we really do need to change the way the institutions like the one, uh, the campus of which we're on at the moment. Now, I'm going to descend from the clouds because this is all, I'm, I'm sure, very theoretical. And I'm going to talk to you about some things that might be done. And they go to the very core of the diagnosis that I'm making. So if you accept any, it's about who has access to land, how you pay for labor, and I'll summarize this in different words. Are you extracting or are you circulating wealth? Are you sharing wealth? And therefore, do we all have access to the capital that we generate? So I'm showing you the picture of a family from uh, Virginia that came to its own conclusions on what they might do about factor of production number one. So this is the farm of Chris Newman and family. And here's what they stated, made headlines in the Washington Post, my part of the world. We resolved to evolve our business into a farming collective with a particular focus on providing opportunities of ownership for people traditionally denied such roles in agriculture. People of color, LGBT folks, and women in particular. So, even though he didn't use this word, what he was referring to was land reform. So here's where I want to tie together several of what appear to be unrelated threads. If you accept that the current system is not working for the majority of people, that means we need to rethink how land was both stolen and redistributed, and what we might do to try to do what we can to make it good for the descendants of people who we exploited, as well as make it better for people who will be our descendants, then there's an opportunity right now that you know for a fact it may be happening in your family or your neighbors where this dialogue is happening. The system's not working. We can't make it work for ourselves. I can't recommend to my children that they take over this land. I'm telling them to go study software engineering. This doesn't work. But yet you have the land. What to do with this land? There are opportunities for what to do with this land that respond to higher moral calling as well as an economic criteria and calling. Um, I'm going to tell you about an example that I uh, know of from a uh, community college in South Dakota with very limited resources, but with those resources doing what they can to address uh, the issues that I've described. And these will be my parting words for you in case you're wondering how much more work to put up with here. Um, I um, admire what these folks are doing with their limited resources, and I often uh, share this example uh, when I witness people performing what out of the best intentions of their heart they refer to as a land acknowledgement at the beginning of a meeting. And uh, I'm sure you've experienced these. Uh, these are the efforts to say before you begin an event to recognize who actually was on the land that now has been taken. And I recognize the intent. I value that intent. And I think that the majority of the time, they're best not that. The reason for that has to do with the fact that one, oftentimes they're not properly done. I can tell the person who's looked up in Wikipedia who the group was. They don't know much beyond them around that, even though they might have neighbors from uh, that group nearby. Many times they don't consult them. They can't pronounce their name. And after they're done with that, nothing happens. They still have the land. The native descendants still don't have their land. We're still enjoying the wealth that we built on their land. They're still in misery because of what has happened to them. Nothing has changed other than maybe we've been virtuous and exhibitionists for the public. Rather than do that, what this school in South Dakota has done was to consult with their native neighbors and decided that there were two things that they could do that would be real. One is take a part of their land endowment and give it back. No condition. The other part is to take part of that land and make it available for young native farmers to enter into farming. You can see how that's much more tangible and real than 
you say, I am sorry for what happened before, but I'm not responsible for it. But I recognize why it puts me where I am, and here's what I can do to try to make things better. Now, um, Bruce told you not to refer to the fact that I talked to generations of farmers in, in Iowa. I, I know the heart of gold uh, in communities that far. I had, I had young students look at me in the eye and say, believing that it was the truth, we are so blessed by God to have this land, which appeals to the Indians. And I'm not qualified to address that, but I know, as I've gone through with you, that there were very deliberate actions that took place five generations ago that explained why we actually have the land. So knowing that, we can't go on as if that didn't happen. So these are some tangible things that can be done. And I would implore all of us to think creatively about those things that can be done in communication with our Native neighbors, with our African American neighbors, with our Hispanic laborers, We're trying to come up with a way that wires things differently. The last example that I'll give you about how this can be done is a strawberry farmer who, uh, by the name of Jim Conklin, who runs Swamp Berry Farm in California in a community called Davenport, just north of Santa Cruz. Jim Cochran operated a very conventional strawberry operation and decided he no longer wanted to do that. It was toxic. He had become friends with his laborers. He didn't want them to be exposed to some of the most toxic communities that are known. And so he worked with a researcher by the name of Stephen Wilson at the University of Santa Cruz to try to come up with an alternative, first of all, to the chemical intensive system. It took a lot of effort. I'm, I'm jumping to the pump line. They figured out how to do it through a system of intensive rotational management to manage nematodes, the, the main pest for strawberries, and to maintain good cosmetic quality of strawberries that they produce and they could sell to Bristol, the major market. So he accomplished that, and then he did better. He said, I'm going to negotiate with my laborers for what they believe is going to be fair wages, and remember I told you it's laughable to talk about benefits, retirement benefits and medical benefits with my workers. He said to them, unionize so that I can negotiate with you. And when they did that, here was the, the negotiation. The negotiation was, we all have a stake in this farm being successful. So whatever we do, I need to have it in my economy to be able to meet what you're demanding. So I need your ideas. You're the people who do the production. You plant, you weed, you harvest. You know this farm better than I do. How can we make this farm the most profitable farm for all of us? And I'll share that profit with you. And boy, those farm neighbors knew exactly what. The first thing that they told them was, you know, there is a large share of what you're producing that is just money that you're leaving in the river. Because supposedly it doesn't meet the cosmetic standards, it's not ready to harvest at the right time. So what they came up with together was lots of different distribution channels so that not a single strawberry goes to waste. So he'll sell the best organic strawberries, which by the way, the organic strawberry industry has taken off, imitating, appropriating what these men talking came up with. Prior to that, he would have laughed at it. And an agricultural scientist would have said, you can't do organic strawberries, it's stupid, don't even try it. It's, you know, use your finger. But they came up with a system, so now it's taking over the industry. Now you'll find organic strawberries from all over the place. But these folks innovate. But if you want to buy a strawberry, strawberry, some of it is going to the conventional uh, organic market, but you will drive past uh, his farm and see that there's a farm stand there. You can actually stop if you like, go in and see how the non cosmetically acceptable strawberries have been turned into piles and compost and all kinds of other things that the talk that we heard about last night uh, uh, reminded us with the. Uh, um, what was the name of the firm? What name? Fermentable example. Fabulous example, very similar idea. And ultimately, what they did was to say, you can have new picks here. So the very last strawberries are actually harvested by people who want to go into the field and pay pennies on the dollars for what they might pay at a supermarket. All of that extra money turned into benefits for the farmers, and now, or the farm leaders. And now, Jim is about to retire. You know what that man is doing? He is sharing ownership of his farm and his farm laborers. Okay. That would only blow the mind of probably an agriculturist or a land grant school. But if you actually sat down and thought about these things, you could think of these things. We can. And we should. And if we do that sort of thing, then we can all together come up with the image of a system that truly is better 
for all of us. Thank you.